Good afternoon and evening, everyone. Thanks for joining the Solutions webinar. My name is Jerry Parr, and I'm president and CEO of the Willow Tree Early Education team out of Houston, Texas. Um, today, we're going to have a chance to talk a little bit about something that my team and I have been seeing as we've been traveling around the country uh, working with grantees. A lot of what we do is with class. And um, it's something that we've, we've, we've seen as we've um, been going across into programs and looking at different parts of uh, what, uh, what, what programs are doing. Um, and we've been collecting data around class and just playing around with some different things. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I hope you find it as interesting and fascinating as we have. Um, next slide, please. What I'd like you to, to do is to begin to rethink uh, class. One of the things that we're seeing as class, which began, as we know, as a professional development tool, um, then moved into monitoring as OHS uh, uh, be, uh, began to use it in response to the uh, legislation. Uh, and now we're also starting to see class being used more and more as a part of programs professional development, or I'm sorry, excuse me, per performance evaluation. And as a result of that, we're gonna ask you to take a look at what we've seen and begin to refocus some of your class lenses. Take a look at the next slide. Next slide, please. Before we do that, let's take a look at, for the purposes of this presentation, what I'm talking about when I, the distinction between professional development and performance evaluation. Uh, for, for me, it's just the distinction between coaching model and a performance appraisal model. You can see lots of different definitions for the two, but for us, think of coaching versus appraisal. Next slide. Some things that I'd like you to, to take away from our, our talk today. Uh, perception is reality. And right now, there's a perception among some programs that there's a zero tolerance for error. And that's kind of top down from the office of Head Start, from administrators, teachers are, are thinking that from uh, program policies. Uh, one of the things that happens then is there's a difference or I want you to think also that there's a difference between monitoring and policing. Uh, when policing happens, zero tolerance can lead to intolerance, which can lead to a lack of creativity and a lack of engagement. Also, the more we use accurate data creatively, the better outcomes we see for children, for staff, and for program planning. And finally, if class is used for anything other than professional development, we're going to suggest that you need to include wider fields of view as you use the class tool. Next slide, please. Poll number one.
Okay, so it looks like roughly half, almost exactly half of everyone has included um, performance, excuse me, I'm trying to move my screen around here a little bit. Ed, can, can you put that poll back up? I just lost the poll. Jerry, the poll's up. Jerry, the poll's up. Folks can see okay, it. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm just seeing poll number one screen. Okay. So, it, 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 and we can go to the next slide then. So in poll number one, it looks like we're, we're split almost evenly on, on all, all three questions there. There we go, thank you. So uh, about half of you have class coming up this year. About uh, a third of you had one last year. About half of you uh, are including corrective actions in your ongoing monitoring procedures. And about half of you are using uh, class as part of your performance evaluation process. So good, um, good. Then we, we have lots to talk about. Next slide. So just, I'm gonna go through these slides very quickly because I know you're all familiar with this, but the reason that we're even talking about class is that it, it became part of the Head Start Act. Uh, OHS uh, monitoring review uh, is required to use a valid and reliable research-based observational instrument. And that instrument um, is, was, was determined to be class. And next slide. And that it has to uh, assess multiple, multiple dimensions of teacher-child interactions. And that was kind of a change from what we've done before. We've used a lot of eaters and actors. Uh, but this is one that specifically looks at interactions between child and teacher. Uh, next slide, or next bullet. And this is the big one. It also requires us to be part of the system for designation and renewal, which put a lot of pressure on programs. Next. Uh, class takes a look at emotional support. Next bullet. Classroom, Classroom organization. organization. Instruction, instructional support. Next slide, next slide. And then, uh, and then uh, what class what scores class cause a grant to be uh, required to compete as part of DRS? Um, there are two circumstances under which a grantee is required to compete. The first one's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Uh, most programs that we talk to agree that this is, this is a good thing. They get it. Um, not a lot of pushback on this. OHS set these thresholds that there's a, a four in emotional support, a three in classroom organization, and a two in instructional support. And uh, those are static numbers uh, from monitoring season to monitoring season. Those remain the same so far and uh, are targets that you can, you can, um, you, you know what they are and you can reach for them. Next slide. There's a second part that makes it a little more complicated that each year the 10% of grantees reviewed that receive the lowest average scores in each domain are required to compete. And if a program scores in the bottom 10%, uh, then, then uh, they'll, they'll be a uh, cause to recompete. Um, there's some confusion about what that means. Um, uh, the last bullet you can read for yourself, that's, um, uh, you know, if the hypotenuse of the isosceles triangle is greater than X and the train that left Chicago at 55 miles per hour is carrying a load of bananas, then Y is equal to a greater than. Um, 
trying to get a little humor in, cl in the class world. Uh, that number is one that causes a bit more consternation in the, in the Head Start nation. Um, that's one where at the end of each monitoring season, when the last reports are signed and the math is done, um, it's not until then that programs uh, know whether or not they are going to recompete. So some programs have to wait a long time um, from when their review happens until, uh, until they know for sure. Um, and um, you know, that, that causes some anguish out there. So next slide. These are the latest scores that were, that were recently posted, and they're on eClick. Uh, so if we take a look at the next slide, which is a link to eClick, and you guys can take a look at all that there, and I'm sure you've already been on there as soon as those are posted. I know programs get up there because they're quite anxious to know what it, what it looks like for next year. You'll notice those scores are getting quite high. So, um, you know, that's why we spend so much time out there helping programs with their class. Uh, next slide, please. And this is poll number two. Please answer question two only. So poll results are in, and because the poll was so similar, we've got very similar results, which certainly makes sense. Um, okay, so we're split, split the same. Okay, next slide. So let's take a look. When we have a policy of monitoring and coaching versus a policy of policing, what happens when programs overcorrect as a reaction to the perception of a zero tolerance federal policy? And I wanna be really clear here. I, I am 100% convinced that there is not a zero tolerance policy, but I'm also 100% convinced that that doesn't matter as long as we feel like there is. And, um, you know, I, I, I meet with lots and lots of programs and lots and lots of staff, uh, and, I, and I feel as though they're, they, there's still a sense out there that um, if they don't get everything right, uh, their grant is at risk and, and, you know, their money's gonna go away and they're gonna be embarrassed in the community. And, and as a result of that, they're, they're tightening the screws on their staff and on themselves. And, so, you know, real or not, if that's how you're feeling, that's what we have to deal with. So let's take a look at what happens when we feel that way. We can think that if we tighten down those screws and if we try to make it so that there are no errors in our programs and if we add policies and if we've got layers and layers of monitoring and if we've got checks to our checks and balances to our balances that we would be more and more foolproof. And 
surprisingly and counterintuitively, the opposite happens. And what we find and what we see a lot is that creativity goes down, loyalty to leadership goes down, morale drops, workplace toxicity increases. And really interesting to me is that the less productive and more destructive employees are the ones who begin to thrive in those environments. <coughs> Next slide. Let's look at what some studies across the world show. This is a universal truth. This isn't just in, in Head Start, and isn't just in America. So let's take a look at, at just a couple of little uh, references to this. Um, autocratic leadership often creates a more stressful work environment. What happens then is employees may worry less about completing business functions to the best possible outcome and begin to worry more about avoiding punishment from leaders and managers. Employees can also face strict punishment or penalties for operating outside company guidelines. And business owners using an autocratic leadership style actually can increase their employee turnover. And I selected um, this example because one of the things that we're seeing increase in our industry is turnover. Teacher turnover, administrative staff turnover, turnover across Head Start. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that and the impact of that on our programs and part of the role that class is playing on that. Next slide. Another example. So we've established that overwritten paperwork and nasty management is ineffective. Sadly, this is only the start of the problem. Excessive discipline may cause excessive deviance. Um, and Lawrence and Robinson in a 2007 study suggested excessive organizational power leads to Next tab, please. A loss of autonomy, identity, and a sense of injustice among employees, which in turn, next please, causes frustration among the workforce. The authors also suggest that an attempt to keep employees in line, next, actually does the opposite. It motivates employees to engage in deviance to get retribution for injustice. And this retribution could be as simple as employees intentionally being, and I can't see the bottom of that page. So let's go to the next slide. And the final example is one way some organizations ensure employees are following the book is through, bullet please, excessive monitoring. And we're seeing that so um, uh, much in, in Head Start programs where uh, more and more monitoring, more and more um, uh, people are doing the monitoring, more and more checklists are, are part of the monitoring, more and more follow-up to the, to the monitoring and the follow-up to the follow-up. And not only is this a waste of resources, it paradoxically damages productivity. A wealth of evidence shows that, next bullet, excessive monitoring results in significantly increased anxiety and stress which aside from causing a toxic work environment, directly harms employee productivity and increases absenteeism. And again, uh, uh, intentionally selected this example because uh, we're gonna tie this into how this impacts your class scores and a way that you can take a look at your score at a system level so that you can kind of adjust your thinking um, and have a more accurate analysis of the data that you're collecting. Okay, next slide, please. This is just an, um, um, an, a, uh, an article that I'd suggest that you take a look at that captures a lot of what the uh, examples we're talking about. Next one, please. So here's some of the things that we're seeing, we're gonna talk about. Um, we're seeing higher turnover rates, especially in the classroom. What are some of the impacts of that? You're having higher training costs. Whoop. <laughs> uh, we're seeing that, uh, that you've got midterm teachers and aides that are coming in without orientation to policies and culture. Uh, the, um, uh, what happens a lot of times in Head Start is that we've got intense training in a pre-service environment, and then there's no mechanisms in place to do onboarding of staff if they come in anytime after that. Uh, and they're often 
trying to be trained on the fly. Uh, they're either the teacher that's in the room is, is supposed to be the one who has to do their training. Um, oftentimes now that teacher that's in the room um, is the, is, is new themselves. And, um, the training is just, is just not being effectively, uh, managed. So, um, I'm sorry, I was reading, <laughs> I was distracted by a chat and Ed, thanks for covering that. So somebody asked if the, uh, presentation presentation would be available afterwards. And yes, it will be. Um, we also seen classroom management issues, again, tied to some of the same thing. There's a lot of new staff with turnover. There's a lot of untrained or undertrained staff. There are a lot of different teams. Um, you know, children are, are, are walking into classrooms with a, a one teacher that one day, a different teacher the next day, a sub the next day. We'll talk more about that, and we'll also talk about how that ties into class scores. Um, there's a disruption to continuity of care model. We've got lowered class scores, and what we're seeing so frequently are that class coaches who are often the solution to many of these problems are in classrooms as subs because they're the other credentialed staff and the only other available resource to the program and they rarely are having time available to actually act as coaches also we're seeing and this this is in and out of the classroom, at the admin level, in kitchens, on buses, in classrooms, increased stress levels. Increased stress levels are leading to incredibly toxic workplaces, turnover at all levels, deteriorating interpersonal skills and relationships, misinformation about the class monitoring process, misinformation about class scoring, and inter-rater reliability leading to fl flawed data analysis. Next slide, please. Poll number three. Okay, well, we've got a couple of redundancies here, you guys. Sorry about that. Okay, so I guess you can predict the poll results for the third time. So we're again split. Good memories. Okay, we'll move on. So let's take a look at one of the trends that we're seeing out there, which is as we're seeing class shifting to use as a performance, measuring tool. Let's take a look at that impact uh, on program. Next slide, please. So we're, we're seeing programs keeping class in balance. Um, you know, it started off as a professional development tool. Um, and um, uh, programs are, tend to be real ready for OHS review. They've got accurate scoring. Uh, program planning is, is really good. We tend to see collaborative cultures 
in the in the classrooms and in administrative and, and throughout the program, good uh, uh, shared governance. Um, there are significant cost savings in that model. Teacher development is strong. The, it's process focused and it's very supportive. Um, you know, those of you that are are using class as a professional development tool, it's a really solid, good tool for that. Uh, designed well, um, gives you good information. Uh, in the coaching model, works really well, and you can see that in uh, in program in, in in your in your child outcomes, in your professional development, your teacher training, your in your uh, outcomes across the board. Uh, let's take a look at when we shift a little bit. Next slide. Again, um, one more positive here. When the class coach mentor is used strictly for that role, when they're not a sub, when they're, and we'll talk about some of the other roles that they're used, um, we, we see good outcomes still, good program loyalty, positive professional growth, real good trust, and a lot of mutual respect. Next slide. Now let's see what happens when it starts to shift over. When we start to use class as a performance evaluation tool, we're starting to see increased turnover, particularly in the classroom. We're starting to see inaccurate class scoring. We're seeing de decreased morale, again, particularly in the classroom, but it also trickles up through the coaches and then into admin. And we're seeing wasted resources. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about that, about why, and about ways to fix that. Okay, next slide, please. So um, I mentioned uh, that when, you, when you're moving it over, one of the things I wanted to talk about, we're seeing often that the coach mentor is the messenger about a corrective action or something wrong with class two. And where we're seeing that, we're seeing the relationship uh, deteriorate and the um, coaching message is no longer as impactful as it used to be. So the teacher feels disrespectful, the adversarial relationship begins to develop. Um, and, um, and we see that too where there's a, a, with adverse actions and some programs are actually using class scores as part of their merit-based pay system. And if the coach mentor is part of that decision-making, then it's really hard for them to be part of the professional development, which their original intent was. Um, sometimes it's, it's, it's almost inadvertent where you've got programs with uh, a lot of ge geography involved. If somebody's headed out to a program that's um, challenging to get to, somebody may say, hey, listen, can you um, uh, uh, take this out while you're on the way? Maybe that coach was on their way out to go tell somebody that they just did a really great thing, you know, that they just finished their observation and they want to go talk to them about what a wonderful job they did. And oh, by the way, um, you turned in your uh, attendance sheets late. Well, the teachers are going to hear all about that attendance sheets in their in their mind and forget about what they the coaching part of that discussion. So caution there. Next slide. What are some of the unintended consequences of class as part of a performance evaluation? Well, teachers are feeling disrespected and then they begin to underperform. Intuitively, they know they're being measured against the wrong metrics and they feel powerless. And we're gonna talk about what those wrong metrics are and what you guys can do to fix that. Professional development message gets lost in the shadow of corrective action, just talked about that, and those adversarial relationships impact the coach-mentor relationship. There's also some murky cause and effect which cause inaccurate scores and cause anger and resentment. Talk about that in a little bit. And there's also something which I'm calling policy collisions, which I'm seeing out there more and more over the last couple of years than I've ever seen before. Um, and there's something um, with inaccurate planning data. And when we've got inaccurate planning data, it's leading to some, some real um, problematic decision making at the, at the leadership level. They're making really good decisions based on based on what their what their data, 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 data,
and that's making and that's real making problems real go problems unattended go to and unfair. Um, so next slide, please. So I want to talk about the policy collisions. What do I mean by that, and and how does that have an impact on class? So some of the some of what's happening is you've got a lot of monitoring going on, which we talked about earlier, and you've got a lot of different systems that are monitoring you. So you may have class that's part of monitoring. You've got licensure that's part of monitoring. You've got monitoring, you know, OHS standards that are monitoring. Uh, you may be uh, being looked at through uh, ECHRs, um, different systems, different tools. And we're talking to teachers that are saying that within those standards, there are conflicts that one set of standards will say you have to do this, and another one will say you have to do this, and those, those have completely polar opposites. And they kind of have to pick which one to do wrong. Some of those are internal. Uh, you may have a cook that says, and this is a real example, um, a cook that says they want their, um, their meal count by 9.15 a.m and an ed coordinator that says you can't do paperwork while the kids are in the classroom. So they have to figure out which corrective action they want. Do they want one from the cook or do they want one from the ed coordinator? Um, those, those policy collisions cause that teacher to have uh, a lot of stress. Eckers may say one thing, um, class monitor may look for another, and those policies clash those impact the scores. Uh, so we're asking programs to take a look. Some of the policies are legacy policies. They've been in there for a long time. You just get rid of them. Some of them are, are, um, are just, you know, just different parts of your program and, and, and those uh, administrators need to get together and just review uh, policies and take a look and say, are teachers being uh, delivered corrective actions because our policies are causing them to do something, and if so, is it the right person who's being corrected? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how you identify where a corrective action should be delivered. And the other thing, and the reason I have a picture of the, uh, the uh, Golden Gate Bridge there, is what we're hearing from teachers is they're going kind of chameleon-like. So if the, class reviewer is coming in to observe them, then they kind of shift how they're doing things. They may actually rearrange their rooms. I mean, you know, whatever they need to do to do well on the class score. If the Eckers evaluator is coming in, then they, then they shift something back. Uh, it could be part of their routine. It could be part of their environment. Whatever it is to that they need to do to score well on whatever instrument is observing them. We know children need uh, structure and routines, and we know that trust is, is built through structure and routines, and that kind of shifting around um, constantly is uh, impacting our children and in the classrooms, and then that in turn impacts scores. So, uh, the, and the reason the bridge is there is because I once, uh, many years ago, heard a, a great um, uh, definition of struct, of, of um, of structure was, you know, if you if you go across a bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, and those railings and the walls are there, you you can go across that all day, every day, and you just have a wonderful ride, and you you know you 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 enjoy the scenery, and I mean I know there's some of you out there that hate bridges, but for those of you that don't, you, you just enjoy that ride, and you never fell off, you just never ever fell off that bridge. But if you took away all those walls and all those uh, supports, then that would be a white knuckle ride that would scare you and you still would never fall off, but you would think every second of that ride you were gonna fall off. It, it just, you'd be petrified about the whole thing. Well, that kind of structure and support and trust and consistency is what the children are, are looking for in our classrooms and it's going away. So next slide. So here's what, what, what we've learned. I wanna get beyond some of the standard reporting and analysis. What my teams, when we go out, we collect all sorts of stuff. You know, it, a couple of years ago, I just said, you know, when you're out there, just jot down things. Just maybe it makes no sense at all. Doesn't matter to me, just jot it down. What, you know, how many kids are in the classroom? What are the gender of the kids in the classroom? 
you know, what time is it? Um, uh, what shape are the tables? Uh, just anything. Just, just give me piles and piles and piles of data. So we started collecting data that way. And, uh, and we were also seeing the same staff over lots of time. And one of the things that we were seeing was scores weren't static. And I think that's okay if those scores are always constantly rising. There's a good reason. You, you would think the professional development, the training, the experience, the coaching, you want to see those class scores constantly rising. But when you see them up and then down and then up and then down, uh, that's what caused the curiosity to say, I wonder why those scores would go down um, sometimes. Maybe they're 5-5-5-3-5-5. Five, 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 three, five, five. That, that was what was puzzling me. So we started looking at, at, at factors that may influence those scores that we weren't looking at. And we had all that, that data and we created some software that allowed us to look beyond what we were looking at and came up with some really interesting kind of things. Let's take a look at the next slide. So, you know, we, have, we, we were looking at some you know, dimensions by program types, by region and service area, by centers and classrooms domains by those same things, and we were comparing scores to the national average by all those kind of things. That's kind of where we started branching out, um, and, um, and we were slicing and dicing and, and, and having fun looking at that, but that wasn't enough. Let's take a look at the next slide. So we also had some assumptions. We knew that classrooms are very dynamic places, and we know that they change Classrooms can change during the day, they change during the week, they change during the month, they change during the year, and we know that there's a lot of things that impact what a classroom's like. We also know that there's agency-wide staff turnover, staff attendance has a direct influence on, on teachers' effectiveness in the classroom, and we were seeing lots of attendance issues, we were seeing lots of, of turnover, so we wanted to look more at that. We also know that stress, has a destructive uh, impact on things. Cultures, workplace cultures, people physically, people mental health. Um, and we also, oh, we also saw, go back a slide please. We also saw that teachers were amazing at filling other people up. They would see, you know, had their parents, had their children, had their colleagues that just needed support. And they would give and give and give until they were empty, but we weren't seeing them being filled up. And we thought that had, had something that we needed to think about. We saw teacher morale and the morale of those around them, uh, and we know that morale had an effect. And we also saw class scores lower than they intuitively felt um, had an impact on them. So we, we looked at all that, next slide. Um, and it became clear to us that teachers were bearing the burden for the entire program's challenge. And then we, we, we looked at this then as a cause and effect model. And it, and it became clear to us that, that cause and effect have to be a real, real critical part at a systems level of how you're analyzing class data. Um, and I, th I think we're short on time here, but so uh, the reason there's a jack in the box there is because um, people can often jump to conclusions about, about cause and effect. And one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the conclusions we often jump to uh, with, um, that I used in an example is if you ask a, an audience of early childhood educators why, why uh, young children bite, uh, very frequently the immediate answer is because they, uh, are frustrated about language, that their, their language um, skills are not always there. And that is 100% correct. But it's not 100% the only reason. There are other reasons that children bite. And one of the reasons is um, they cause and effect. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, if you give a child uh, who is uh, biting because of cause and effect, for example, they... Um, bite somebody and it gets loud. It get, uh, people make noise and the big people in the room come running over and hold me and hug me and it's, it's, it's wonderful. And every time I do that, that happens. If you, if you try to correct that, if the consequence for that is 
is you read stories to them and you give them words and you say, let's use our words and all that. It's meaningless. That's not why they're biting. Well, we do that a lot with our grownups too. So we're, we're, we're finding ways to examine the cause and effect of what's happening. So let's take a look at the next slide, please. So we realize we need to look at other key influences. Class scores need to be analyzed at a systems level as well as um, a teacher level if it's gonna be part of a professional development. Now remember, I'm, I'm talking about is when, when class is being used beyond the uh, professional development piece because all the, you know, all the science for, for class is professional development. So I'm, don't touch that, don't mess with that. But if you're using it for professional development, then stay with me. And, and, and listen to this. Okay, so look, next slide, please. So let's take a look at this. Mrs. Late Snack, for example. We observed her on 3-2-17, uh, uh, and she had a 6 uh, across all, of, all domains. And 3-11, 6 is across all domains. 3-30-17, she began to drop. 4-5-17, back up again. So instead of just accepting that, a couple of things have to happen. First of all, I want to say to myself, why? Why has got to be the most important question in early childhood? We have to ask ourselves why about virtually everything that's happening in the early childhood world. That's thing one. Thing two is, if I only saw Mrs. Late Snack on 3.30.17, I'm leaving with her scores at three and two and two. That's going into her file and that's who I think she is. So one of the things that we're, we're suggesting to folks that are using this as professional development is you've got to be out there a lot more. Now, that may not be something the teachers want to hear, but it has to be the reality. Otherwise, you've got a, a really skewed picture of that teacher. So, all right, so why, 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 why has that score dropped? I don't know. Let's take a look at some stuff. Take a look at the next score. I'm sorry, the next slide. So we've we created a tool, and it what it allows us to do is to drill down on everything. We can drill down on all the what what used to be kind of extra things that we collected, but now actually turned out to have a lot of meaning. We can drill down, we can we can look at a domain, we can look at a dimension. And hopefully, if everything works, we're going to give you a, a live demonstration of this in just a moment. But let me walk you through it, talk you through it first. We can, we can click on a dimension, and it'll bring up all of the questions for the dimension. So we can drill down at a question level, and we can take a look exactly where uh, the numbers changed. So this is important to us for a couple of things. One, it means for training, because remember I talked to you about resources and and, and cost savings and things. This is where this all became important because instead of taking 20 teachers at your precious pre-service time, um, uh, maybe you find out there's only three of them that actually needed some very specific coaching and training on some very specific areas. And um, so you can really drill down and, and start to parse out who needs what, where, and when. And uh, so that's part of that. But now, what we can find from, from drilling down here was that every time that Mrs. Late Snack's scores were dropping, what was happening in her world was the cook was bringing snack 20 minutes late. That when that wasn't happening, the scores were remaining high. So what was going wrong wasn't something that was the teacher's fault, it was something external to, to her control or his control, and it was impacting that score. So what does that mean? It means if I only was there on the day that she got a three, a two, and a two, that's what I thought, if that's her merit, if that's her performance evaluation, she knows she's a six, I don't know she's a six, that's where some of that tension comes in, some of the morale issues and some of the, 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 the uh, stress and the I'm leaving. I'm going to go get another job where they appreciate me kind of stuff comes in. Um, but also the um, uh, money that you may spend trying to bring her from a three to a six where she's already a six, but you don't know it, where you might better be coaching the cook on how to be more timely or whatever caused that to be late. 
and I, I don't want, mean to just pick on cooks. I love cooks. Uh, but it could be a bus run that was late. Uh, we're, we also see it in things like referrals that aren't being done. Or, you know, perhaps your LEA is not helping you get referrals done, and there's a child or children that really need a one-on-one -on -one aid. And if you're doing a class score in a room where there's children that need extra adult support, that score is going to be impacted by that. So that may not be that teacher's fault. And if it's in a, in a coaching model, then that's really okay. You can work on that. It's not a big deal. If it's in a performance evaluation model, that is a big deal. And it's not that teacher's fault. So if, if, if that corrective action is applied, maybe that's not where it should be. Maybe it should be to that person up the line, maybe the disability coordinator who hasn't been advocating hard enough for that referral to go through. Or maybe the LEA did the IEP and they made it um, speech language only. Uh, and um, it really needed to have somebody force them to have a one-on-one -on -one aid. So I, I, and I'm hurting a little bit because I know our time is short. So I hope that makes some sense. But so that made us um, kind of look both inside and outside of the, uh, of the classroom. We, so we look at attendance rates. Um, one of the things we see a lot through this model's lens is we've got teachers who score really high until um, chronically absent staff cause their teaching teams to be broken up and they um, end up uh, with their, the aid that they work so beautifully with is assigned to another classroom and they get an aid who may or may not be trained, who they may or may not be work, have worked with before. And that may be the day that you come in and do their class score, which doesn't reflect what their true score should be in any way, shape or form. In our model, that corrective action or that low score or the, or the uh, performance evaluation score ought to belong to that chronic teacher. Again, how do you, you know, from an HR perspective, from a cost saving perspective, from a training perspective, you may be allocating funds to train that teacher when in fact you should be allocating resources to fixing chronic absenteeism. Um, so next slide. And um, Nasser, uh, are, are we able to, uh, Ed, are we able to t have Nasser's uh, screen taken over or? Uh, Nasser can speak, but he uh, cannot take over the screen. Okay, all right. So then, anyway, then this is just another screenshot of, um, of, of some of how, we're, how we pull that data, how we analyze it. Uh, in, in our live shot of this, any of those bars, what we can do is we could just tap on that bar and it explodes into a, a, a wealth of data and um, uh, and drills right down right down to the uh, right down to the question level uh, of each dimension so okay and next slide Next slide. Jerry, yeah. Nasser has the screen, so he's going to make a couple yeah. of slides. Oh, okay. And while he's doing that, there's a question. Um, Dorothy, shouldn't interactions remain positive between teachers and children even when the cook is late? Absolutely, 100%. Um, and so what I mean, you know, productivity would be a great example of what might go on. Or maybe the teacher got really rattled, especially with an observer there. and you know, everything that was planned just kind of fell apart. So I, I made it go from a six to a three, just to be really illustrative of what happened. It probably wouldn't fall quite that much. Um, but the point is, uh, just trying to show that there's a lot of different things that influence um, um, scoring, uh, again, for performance, develop, uh, performance evaluation purposes. Um, in a coaching model, it would be completely different. But yes, yeah, absolutely. You, uh, Few, if any, of these things should uh, uh, affect sensitivity um, or, or th those, those interactions. So that's a really good point. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Nasser, you might want to speak up just a little bit more. 
Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Nasser Doss from Detroit. Um, that's why, yeah, it's afternoon uh, on the West Coast too. So I will go very quickly uh, through this tool. As a matter of fact, the tool starts with the data collection tool, which is the class observation. Uh, and as you can see here, we have the dimensions, we have uh, the questions and the score. Once we go through all of that, and there is a lot of reports here can, uh, that can be generated out of the box. But at the end of the day, uh, after we collect all of the information, is the voice okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. After we collect all of the information, actually, we push the data through this analytical tool. Um, as a matter of fact, this is Microsoft Excel, but uh, you can think about it like Excel on steroids. Uh, it's business intelligence stack on Excel. And what it allows us to do here is to slice and dice the data and drill down to the actual cause as Jerry just described. For example, so if you are familiar with the class, the, uh, we have the domains here. Every domain, so I will click the first domain. The, the, the thing that you see here is, is called cross highlight. So this domain consists of these three dimensions, correct? And those are all of the questions, nine questions or so, in all of the three dimensions. But when you click a certain dimension, it gives you only the questions. And as you can see here, this question, and by the way, we can pop out any screen so we make it bigger. This question, on specific, which is clarity of learning objectives, we score the worst here. So if you wanna concentrate your training efforts and staff development efforts, maybe this is the item that needs uh, uh, specific attention more than this item, for example, which is the student interest, where uh, this center or class scored the highest. Uh, this is just in a nutshell, but the tool actually can do much more um, di uh, dimension by dimension, actually domain by domain, dimension by dimension, even by different centers or um, different other indicators that we added to the tool, like the late snack or uh, the reassigned or delayed referral and so on. Jerry, do you want to comment on that? No, thank you, Nasser. I think we've come to the end of our uh, of our time, so appreciate that. Um, so I, I hope uh, I hope I hope our message was clear that we just we want everybody to um, uh, to realize that there's a lot of things that influence, and we're stressing out a lot of teachers out there. And um, I think we could take some of the pressure off them by by helping to make sure that. Um, they realize that we appreciate what they're doing and, and maybe uh, looking at class, as in, if we're going to do performance evaluation, by looking at it at a systems level rather than at an individual teacher level. So thanks for, for joining us this afternoon. Wonderful. Thanks, Jerry. And we will go ahead and uh, finalize our session together. We're going to check the recording to see if it has good audio that we can share with you and an evaluation will come out uh, by the end of tomorrow. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Nasser. Thank, Thank you. you.